Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise and joy, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study on humility, the journey toward holiness by Andrew Murray. Today we will begin in chapter 6, which is titled, Humility in Daily Life. Thomas A. Kempis once said, The more humble a man is in himself, the more obedient toward God, the wiser will he be in all things, and the more shall his soul be at peace. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says, For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. It is a solemn thought that our love for God is measured by our everyday relationships with others. Except as its validity is proven in standing the test of daily life with our fellow men, our love for God may be found to be a delusion. It is easy to think that we humble ourselves before God, but our humility toward others is the only sufficient proof that our humility before God is real. To be genuine, humility must abide in us and become our very nature. True humility is to be made of no reputation, as did Christ. In God's presence, humility is not a posture we assume for a time when we think of him or pray to him, but the very spirit of our life. It will manifest itself in all our bearing toward others. A lesson of deepest importance is that the only humility that is really ours is not the kind we try to show before God in prayer, but the kind we carry with us and the kind we carry out in our ordinary conduct. The seemingly insignificant acts of daily life are the tests of eternity because they prove what spirit possesses us. Let me read that again, friends. The seemingly insignificant acts of daily life are the tests of eternity because they prove what spirit possesses us. It is in our most unguarded moments that we truly show who we are and what we are made of. To know a truly humble person, you must follow that one in the common course of daily life. This is what Jesus taught. He gave them an example when he washed their feet. He taught his lessons of humility by demonstration. Humility before God is nothing if it is not proven in humility before others. It is so in the teaching of Paul. To the Romans, he writes in chapter 12, verse 10, Honor one another above yourselves. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited, he says in verse 16. And to the Corinthians, he says, Love does not boast. It is not proud. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. You'll find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 and 5. To the Galatians, Paul said, Serve one another in love. Chapter 5, verse 13. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Galatians 5, 26. To the Ephesians, immediately after the three wonderful chapters on the heavenly life, he said, Live a life completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. That's in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Always giving thanks. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's in chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. To the Philippians, he said, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Philippians 2, 3. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. And to the Colossians, he said, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. You see, it is in our relationships with one another 
in our treatment of each other that true lowliness of mind and a heart of humility are seen. Our humility before God has no value except as it prepares us to reveal the humility of Jesus to our fellow men. Let us study humility in daily life in light of these words. The humble person seeks at all times to live up to the rule, honor one another above yourselves, serve one another, consider others better than yourselves, submit to one another. The question is often asked, how can we count others better than ourselves when we see that they are far below us in wisdom, in holiness, in natural gifts, or in grace received? The question proves at once how little we understand what real lowliness of mind is. True humility comes when, before God, we see ourselves as nothing. We have put aside self, and we've let God be all. The soul that has done this and can say, I have lost myself in finding you, Lord, no longer compares itself with others. It has given up forever any thought of self in God's presence. It meets its fellow men as one who is nothing and seeks nothing for itself. One who is a servant of God and for his sake is a servant of all. A faithful servant may be wiser than his master and yet retain the true spirit and posture of a servant. The humble man looks upon every child of God, the most weak and unworthy, and honors him and prefers him as a son of the king. The spirit of him who washed the disciples' feet makes it a joy to be the least, to be servants of one another. The humble person feels no jealousy or envy, He can praise God when others are preferred and blessed before him. He can hear others praised and himself forgotten, because in God's presence he has learned to say with Paul, I am nothing. He has received the spirit of Jesus, who pleased not himself and sought not his own honor as the spirit of his life. Amid temptations to impatience and irritableness, to hard thoughts and sharp words that come in response to the failings and sins of fellow Christians, the humble person carries the oft-repeated injunction in his heart and shows it in his life. And that would be forbearing one another and forgiving one another, even as the Lord Jesus forgave you. He has learned that in putting on the Lord Jesus, he puts on the heart of compassion, the heart of kindness, the heart of humility, of meekness, and long-suffering. Jesus has taken the place of self, and it is not an impossibility to forgive as Jesus forgave. The person of humility does not consist merely in thoughts or words of self-depreciation, but, as Paul puts it, in a heart of humility, the sweet and lowly gentleness recognized is the mark of the Lamb of God. In striving after the higher experiences of the Christian life, the believer is often in danger of seeking the more visible virtues such as joy, boldness, zeal, contempt of the world, self-sacrifice. Even the old Stoics taught and practiced these rather than the gentler graces, those which are more distinctly connected with Jesus' cross and death to self, poverty of spirit, meekness, humility, and lowliness. Therefore, let us put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, and let us prove our Christ-likeness not only in our zeal for saving the lost, but also in our relationships with others, forbearing and forgiving one another, even as the Lord Jesus forgave us. Let us study the Bible portrait of the most humble man that ever lived, the Lord Jesus, and let us ask our brethren and the world whether they recognize in us the likeness to the original. Let us be content with nothing less than taking each of these texts as the promise of what God will work in us, as the revelation of what the Spirit of Jesus will put within us. Allow each failure and shortcoming to only the more quickly turn us to the meek and lowly Lamb of God in the assurance that where he is enthroned in the heart, 
His humility and gentleness will be the streams of living water that flow from within us. George Fox has said, I knew Jesus, and he was very precious to my soul. But I found something in me that would not keep sweet and patient and kind. I did what I could to keep it down, but it was there. I besought Jesus to do something for me. And when I gave him my will, he came to my heart. And he took out all that would not be sweet, all that would not be kind, all that would not be patient. And then he shut the door. Once again, let me repeat what I have said before. I feel deeply that we have very little concept of what the church suffers as a result of its lack of humility, the self-abasement that makes room for God to prove his power. A Christian who was acquainted with mission statements of various societies expressed his deep sorrow that in some cases the spirit of love and forbearance was sadly lacking. Men and women who could choose their own circle of friends joined together in fellowship with those of contrary opinions, making it difficult to bear and to love and to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And those who should have been encouragers became a hindrance to the work. It appeared the lack of humility was the cause of much of the difficulty. Humility always seeks, like Jesus, to be the servant the helper, and the comforter of others, even to the lowest and most unworthy. Why is it that those who have joyfully given themselves up for Christ find it so hard to give themselves up for fellow Christians? It seems that the church has failed to teach its people the importance of humility, that it is the first of the virtues, the best of all the graces and all the powers of the Spirit. The church of today has failed to show that a Christ-like humility is what is needed and is also in the realm of possibility. But let us not be discouraged. Rather, let the discovery of the lack of this grace stir us up to greater expectation from God. Let us look upon everyone who tries us as God's means of grace, God's instrument for our purification for our exercise of the humility of Jesus. May we have true faith in the sufficiency of God and admit to the inefficiency of self, that by God's power we will serve one another in love. Chapter 7, which is titled Humility and Holiness. Bernard of Clairvaux once stated, It is no great thing to be humble when you are brought low. But to be humble when you are praised is a great and rare achievement. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 2 and 5 read, All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who say to me, Keep away, don't come near me, for I am too sacred for you. We speak of the holiness movement in our times and we praise God for it. We hear a great deal of seekers that are seeking holiness and those who profess to have received holiness, of holiness teaching and holiness meetings. The blessed truths of holiness in Christ and holiness by faith are being emphasized as never before. The great test of whether the holiness we profess to seek or to attain is truth in life will be whether it is manifest in the increasing humility it produces. In the individual, humility is the one thing needed to allow God's holiness to dwell in and shine through him or her. In Jesus, the Holy One of God, who makes us holy, divine humility was the secret of his life. It was the secret of his death and his exaltation. The one infallible test of our holiness will be our humility before God and before others. Humility is the bloom and the beauty of holiness. The chief mark of counterfeit holiness is its lack of humility. Every seeker after holiness needs to be on his guard, lest unconsciously what was begun in the spirit is perfected in the flesh, and then pride creep in where its presence is least expected. Two men went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, 
the other a tax collector. There was no place or position so sacred that the Pharisee could not enter there. Pride can lift its head in the very temple of God and make his worship the scene of its self-exaltation. Since the time Christ so exposed his pride, the Pharisee has put on the garb of the tax collector. The confessor of deep sinfulness and the professor of highest holiness must both be on watch. Just when we are most anxious to have our heart to be the temple of God, we will find the two men coming to pray. And the tax collector will find that his danger is not from the Pharisee beside him, who despises him, but the Pharisee within, who commends and exalts himself. In God's temple, when we think we are in the holy place, in the presence of his holiness, let us beware of pride. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, or even like this tax collector, said the Pharisee in Luke 18.11. It is in the thanksgiving that we render to God, or the confession that God has done it all, that self finds cause for complacency. Yes, even when the language of penitence and trusting God's mercy alone is heard, the Pharisee may take up the note of praise and in thanking God be congratulating himself. Pride can clothe itself in the garments of praise or of penitence. Even though the words, I am not as other men, are rejected and condemned, their spirit may too often be found in our feelings and in our language toward our fellow worshipers and fellow men. If you wonder if this is so, listen to the way Christians speak of one another. How little of the meekness and gentleness of Jesus is seen. It is seldom remembered that deep humility must be the keynote of what we say of ourselves or of each other. There are countless assemblies of saints, mission conventions, societies, or committees where the harmony has been disturbed and the work of God hindered because men who are counted saints are touchy and impatient. They are self-defensive and self-assertive to the point of sharp judgments and unkind words. They do not reckon others better than themselves, and their holiness has little meekness in it. Me is a most exacting person, requiring the best seat and the highest place for itself, and it feels grievously wounded if its claim is not recognized. Most of the quarrels among Christian workers arise from the clamoring of this gigantic me. How few of us understand the true secret of taking our seats in the lowest rooms. In their spiritual history, men may have had times of great humbling and brokenness. But what a different thing this is from being clothed with humility, from having a humble spirit, from having that lowliness of mind in which each counts himself the servant of others, and so shows forth the mind that was in Jesus Christ. Our text is a parody on holiness. Let's read it again. All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people, who say, Keep away, don't come near me, for I am too sacred for you. Jesus the Holy One is the humble one. The holiest will always be the humblest. There is none holy but God. We have as much holiness as we have of God. And according to what we have of God will be our real humility. Because humility is nothing but the disappearance of self in the vision that God is all. The holiest will be the humblest. Though the barefaced boasting Jew of the days of Isaiah is not often to be found, how often his spirit is still seen, whether in the treatment of fellow Christians or of the children of the world. In the spirit in which opinions are given, work is undertaken, and faults are exposed. How often, though the garb be that of the tax collector, the voice is still that of the Pharisee, when he says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Is there such humility still to be found that men count themselves less than the least of all saints? That they count themselves the servants of all? 
Let us be reminded again of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love does not boast. It is not proud. It is not self-seeking. Where the spirit of love is shed abroad in the heart, where the divine nature comes to full birth, and where Christ, the meek and lowly Lamb of God, is truly formed within, there comes the power of a perfect love that forgets itself and finds its blessedness in blessing others. Where this love enters, God enters. And where God has come in his power and revealed himself, the vessel becomes nothing. This is the condition in which true humility can be displayed toward others. The presence of God is not dependent upon times and seasons, but upon a soul ready to do his will and forget itself. Let all teachers of holiness, whether in the pulpit or on the platform, and all seekers after holiness, whether in the closet or the convention, let them take warning. There is no pride so dangerous, so subtle and insidious as the pride of holiness. It is not that a man ever says or even thinks, stay away, I am too sacred for you. The thought would be considered ludicrous. But unconsciously, there can develop a private habit of soul that feels complacency in its attainments and cannot help but see how far it is ahead of others. It isn't always seen in self-assertion or self-praise, but in the absence of self-denial and modesty that reveals a lack of the mark of the soul that has seen the glory of God. It is a tone, a way of speaking of oneself or others in which those who have the gift of discernment cannot but recognize the power of self. Even the world with its keen eye notices it and points to it as proof that the profession of a spiritual life does not always bear spiritual fruits. Beware, friend, lest we make a profession of holiness, delighting in beautiful thoughts and feelings, in solemn acts of consecration and faith, while the mark of the presence of God, which is the disappearance of self, is obviously missing. Flee to Jesus and hide yourselves in him until you are clothed with his humility. That alone is holiness. And let us end today's lesson by repeating once again what we read in chapter 1. A lesson of deepest importance is that the only humility that is really ours is not the kind we try to show before God in prayer, but the kind we carry with us and we carry without us in our ordinary conduct in our day-to-day -day lives. May the Lord Jesus walk beside you, friends, as you make your way down this path of holiness and you consider what true humility seen only in the life of Jesus fully is really all about. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video.